Yes, folks, it's Tales from the Jails with John G. Sutton. Do, please, listen, like and subscribe. You don't know how much it really, really helps. All right? Thanks. Now, I'm going to talk today about Ian Brady being a pseudo-intellectual serial killer. So I'm going to talk about it today. There's a number of videos online on YouTube, one of them by Professor David Wilson, concerning a psychological analysis of this uh, very difficult character. Uh, David Wilson is a criminologist and uh, he has examined the files and details and spoke to many people who actually knew Ian Brady and seems to have come to the same conclusion that I came to when I met him on the landings at Wormwood Scrubs that uh, Brady is a self-proclaimed Superman. That's what he thought he was. Seriously. Uh, it's based on the uh, writings of the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who wrote about Superman, because he was German, you know. But anyway, uh, he meant uh, that people who believe that they are not only uh, intellectually superior to the rest of the people but they are so elevated that their actions are protected by the fact that they are supermen and believe me he managed to convince uh, he, he is uh, so called lover Myra Hindley I never met Myra Hindley although I had some dealings with Myra Hindley but I did meet Ian Brady and he was as uh, Professor David Wilson discovered, a pseudo-intellectual. Uh, when he was on the landings at uh, Wormwood Scrubs, he wouldn't speak to staff. He, he would speak to the governor. He would speak to visiting psychologists and medical professionals, but he would not speak to staff. He was extremely uh, believed that he was something truly special. Well, in actual fact, he was uh, a previously convicted petty thief who had served time in strange ways when he was a much younger man, before he started his uh, life of crime, I mean serious crime, serial killing. And the methods that he used for that were to uh, enhance his self-opinion by torturing and sexual, sexually abusing, torturing and murdering numerous little children. Uh, the first body that they found buried on the moors was Leslie Ann Down. And what uh, himself and Inslee would do was uh, once they'd murdered the children, finished torturing them, etc., take them in the back of his van, he had a little van, and I think it was an Austin van, uh, and drive it up onto the moors, <coughs> the Saddleworth moors, by the way. And if you go up on the Saddleworth moors, you'll see down in the valley there's a, a reservoir. Well, if you're at approximately 90 degrees away from the reservoir, there's a mound of rocks, and that is the area where Ian Brady and Myra Hindley buried the bodies. And uh, they didn't leave the bodies just buried like that. They used to go and have picnics when they were sitting on top of the graves of the victims that they'd murdered. And uh, that was uh, Ian Brady's little idea of entertainment. He was obviously seriously psychologically disturbed, as it was later found after he'd been sentenced and uh, he was committed to uh, psychic institutions. He ended his days at Ashworth Hospital. I previously worked at Ashworth Hospital when I was training to be a hospital officer with the uh, prison department. Now, strange connection with Ian Brady and myself. My father was on the case in the 1960s when he was a detective with the, the Greater Manchester Police uh, and one of his buddies there was called Joe Mouncey. He was a superintendent at the time and uh, he used to visit our house, Joe Mouncey, and it was Joe Mouncey that said there's, there's a serial killer in Greater Manchester and we're going to find him because children kept going missing, you see, like Leslie Ann Downey and 
all the rest of them. So it was uh, the determination of Superintendent Mouncey to find these children and he eventually did. My father was in court the day that they played the tapes that uh, Ian Brady had recorded of the children pleading to be allowed to go home and he said it was the most heartbreaking thing he'd ever heard. These little children saying, oh come on let me go home, I won't tell anybody. Ian Brady, yeah, but he wrote a book and that's another connection, strange connection here. Uh, I had a friend called Colin Wilson. Uh, Colin Wilson was an extremely erudite, internationally famous writer who I only knew through my association with uh, a, m a man called uh, Professor Joe Cooper who, who had written a number of books on uh, elemental beings and spiritual psychic interference with this world and that's how I knew Joe Cooper. Uh, so uh, he was a friend of Colin Wilson's and I was a big fan of Colin Wilson's you see so he said oh, I know him let's go and see him. So we went down to see uh, Colin Wilson and Colin Wilson was telling me I have any interest in that you've met Ian Brady you know because I'm telling him I worked at the scrubs and strange ways and all that. He said because for a long time he was communicating with me <clears throat> he wanted uh, assistance on putting together his book I think it's called The Gates of Janus or something like that written by Ian Brady and I've got a copy signed by Colin Wilson who wrote the foreword <clears throat> to the book and because he did help Ian Brady do that but he said eventually he got to the conclusion that Ian Brady was trying to score points off Colin Wilson you know to verify that he was this mad genius that he believed himself to be because obviously he'd read Colin Wilson's book on alienation which is called uh, The Outsider because Ian Brady believed he was a natural outsider when really all he was was a, a perverted petty thief who had decided to go mad murdering children. <clears throat> and I'm, as I say, I met him on the, on the landings at, at Wormwood Scrubs and he had numerous uh, high profile visitors, members of the House of Lords. One, one gentleman, as I previously discussed here, managed to get himself into his cell one lunchtime and the senior officer in charge of the segregation unit said to me, yeah, stay away from that cell. Don't go anywhere near while that visitor's in. But I recognised this visitor, you see. I knew who he was. I knew his name. Now, a lot of people have said to me, come on, give us his name. I can't. I can't tell you his name. All I can tell you is that uh, he was a very large gentleman, immaculately dressed, obviously well, he looked like a. He spoke like an Exetonian, and uh, was I believe he is an Exetonian, but he was obviously extremely uh, well connected, a member of the House of Lords, and uh, he got himself into Brady's cell, and I was instructed as the officer in charge of the uh, the landings that uh, I would not approach that cell whilst he was inside. When he came out, he was dishevelled. His tie was at one side. He was bright red in his face. He was perspiring what the hell had he been up to in there i've got an idea do you have an idea what you think that member of the house of lords might have been up to visiting ian brady the moors murderer if you have please leave a comment down below seriously so that was my connection with ian brady but have a look on youtube it's professor david williams and uh, he is a very erudite explanation as to the true nature, the psychology of Ian Brady, who is an, uh, uh, was uh, a complete pseudo-intellectual who believed that he was what Frederick Nietzsche called Superman. Man and Superman, you know, that's a play, yeah? But this is Frederick Nietzsche, the, the philosopher. Now, I'm going to ring the bell in a minute, yeah? But that's just a little talk about Ian Brady. Myra Hindley, yeah, well, I'll talk about Myra Hindley on another day, but when she went to the Moors to, uh, it was in all the papers on the TV and everything, to uh, to see if she could locate the, 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 the body of Bennett, I think it's 
John Bennett, you know, the, the child that went missing and they never found, she couldn't locate the grave, but she went to, on the moors, there was helicopters and all sorts of stuff, and the, the police inspector that she was handcuffed to was my brother, Martin Sutton. So if there's any videos out there, there should be, because it was on the news, uh, you'll see him, he's about six foot four. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, it's that time of day, folks. That my little talk on Ian Brady, what a disgusting, horrible, pseudo-intellectual shithouse he was. Uh, I had a request uh, yesterday for me to sing uh, a song by Johnny Cash. So I apologise the sound's not right, because my son-in-law's away on holiday get my computer fixed from the blue screen of death when he comes back but in the meantime I'm going to do my best here to sing uh, a song by Johnny Cash so I'll give you a fair warning here so you can all bugger off if you want bring out your dad right here we go this is uh, a song by Johnny Cash it's one of his uh, most notable notable records this is uh, if I can if I can get this right, uh, it's I Walk the Line. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out because you're mine. I walk the line. I find it very, very easy to be free. I find myself alone internally yes i'll admit that you are simply fine because you're mine i walk the line as sure as night is dark and day is light i keep you on my mind both day and night and happy days i know that you will find because you're mine I walk the line You've got a way to keep me on your side You give me cause for love that I can't hide For you I know I'd even try to turn the tide Because you're mine I walk the line I keep a close watch on this heart of mine I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. There you go. That's my interpretation of Johnny Cash's I Walk the Line. Tales from the Jails. Do please like and subscribe.